really delighted to uh, welcome you to this very exciting talk uh, sponsored by the Center for Global Ethics and Politics and the um, political and social, not Other only way the social and political, <coughs> uh, theory students association. Um, and we, we enjoy that collaboration. So as you saw, I won't uh, take too long on the introduction, but we're really thrilled to have Amy Allen, who is a distinguished professor of philosophy and politics and women's studies and various other interrelated disciplines from Dartmouth College, um, she, where she is also Parents' Distinguished Research Professor in the Humanities and has taught there since 1997. She holds a PhD and an MA in philosophy from Northwestern University and a BA in philosophy from Miami University. Her research interests are in 20th century continental philosophy with a particular emphasis on the intersection of critical social theory, post-structuralism, and feminist theory. And she's published widely on the topics of power, very famous for her analysis of power with, um, subjectivity, agency, and autonomy in the work of Foucault, Habermas, Butler, and Arendt, including two books, The Power of Feminist Theory, uh, uh, subtitled Domination, Resistance, Solidarity, and The Politics of Ourselves, two words, Power, Autonomy, and Gender in Contemporary Critical Theory from Columbia University Press in 2008. Our current research project focuses on the relationship between power and reason in the critical theory tradition in a book project entitled The End of Progress, Decolonizing Critical Theory. I understand that this will be a section of that book. Professor Allen is co-editor-in-chief with Andrew Arado and Andreas Calidas of the journal Constellations, series editor of the Columbia University Press series New Directions in Critical Theory, and executive co-director of SPEP, the Society for Phenomenology and Existential Philosophy. We're delighted to hear her paper on Adorno, Foucault, and the End of Progress, Decolonizing Critical Theory. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much, Carol, for inviting me in for that lovely introduction. And I also want to thank John for all of his help with the logistical arrangements. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so as Carol mentioned, this is, um, this is a part of the next to the last chapter of the book uh, manuscript that I'm working on right now, which is um, titled The End of Progress. Um, and I will try to say a little bit at the beginning to give some idea of what the um, earlier chapters are about um, so that you'll be able to appreciate what this chapter is attempting to do. So in his 1993 sequel to his groundbreaking and field-defining book, Orientalism, Edward Said offers the following indictment of Frankfurt School Critical Theory, quote, Frankfurt School Critical Theory, despite its seminal insights into the relationships between domination, modern society, and the opportunities for redemption through art as critique, is stunningly silent on racist theory, anti-imperialist resistance, and oppositional practice in the empire, end quote. Moreover, Said argues that this is no mere oversight. To the contrary, it is a motivated silence. Frankfurt School critical theory, like other versions of European theory more generally, espouses what Said calls an invidious and false universalism, a blithe universalism that, quote, assumes and incorporates the inequality of races, the subordination of inferior cultures, the acquiescence of those who, in Marx's words, cannot represent themselves and therefore must be represented by others, end quote. Such universalism has, for Said, played a crucial role in connecting European culture with European imperialism for centuries. For imperialism as a political project cannot sustain itself without the idea of empire. And the idea of empire, in turn, is nourished by a philosophical and cultural imaginary that justifies the political subjugation of distant territories and their native populations through claims that such peoples are less advanced, cognitively inferior, and therefore naturally subordinate. So 20 years after Said made this charge, um, not enough has changed. Contemporary Frankfurt School critical theory, for the most part, there are some important exceptions, one of whom is sitting in the front row of this audience, um, but for the most part remains stunningly silent on the problem of imperialism. 
Um, neither of the major contemporary theorists most closely associated with the legacy of the Frankfurt School, Jürgen Habermas or Axel Honneth, has made systematic reflection on the paradoxes and challenges produced by the waves of decolonization that characterized the latter half of the 20th century, a central focus of his work in critical theory. Nor has either theorist engaged seriously with the by now substantial body of literature in post-colonial theory or studies. And in the case of Habermas, this lack of attention is all the more notable given his increasing engagement in recent years with issues of globalization, cosmopolitanism, and the prospects for various forms of post- and supranational legal and political forms. Now, like Said, I believe there is a reason for this silence, and that this reason should be understood in terms of the links between European culture and European imperialism. And also like Said, I will characterize the problem as arriving from the particular role that ideas of historical progress, development, social evolution, and sociocultural learning play in justifying and grounding the normative universalism of critical theorists such as Habermas and Hanet. So as I argue in earlier chapters in um, this book, Habermas and Hanet both rely on a broadly speaking left Hegelian strategy for grounding or justifying the normativity of critical theory, in which the claim that our current communicative or recognitional practices represent the outcome of a progressive learning or social evolutionary process and therefore are deserving of our support and allegiance figures prominently. This is rather explicit, I think, in the work of Hanet and more implicit in the work of Habermas. In other words, they are both deeply wedded to the idea that European Enlightenment modernity, or at least certain aspects or features thereof, represents an advance over pre-modern, non-modern, or traditional forms of life. And perhaps even more troubling, this idea plays a crucial role in grounding the normativity of critical theory for each thinker. At least that's one of the things I argue in the earlier chapters of the book. This is why Habermas continues to defend the universal, context-transcending character of the ideals that emerged historically in the European Enlightenment, even in the wake of charges that his approach is Eurocentric. And that's even in his most reading, recent political writings. And Hanek goes so far as to argue that the idea of historical progress is irreducible or ineliminable for anyone doing critical theory. Um, he published a paper called The Irreducibility of Progress in 2009. But precisely this assumption also proves to be the biggest obstacle to the project of decolonizing their approaches to critical theory. For perhaps the major lesson of post-colonial scholarship over the last 35 years has been that the developmentalist progressive reading of history in which Europe or the West is viewed as more enlightened or developed than Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and so on, and the so-called civilizing mission of the West, which served to justify colonialism and imperialism and continue to underwrite the informal imperialism of the current world economic, legal, and political order, are deeply intertwined. In other words, the progressive reading of history and informal imperialism are deeply intertwined. In other words, as James Tully has pithily put the point, the language of progress and development is the language of oppression and domination for two-thirds of the world's people. So Habermas and Hanet's reliance on a notion of historical progress that is intertwined with, even perhaps a form of, imperialism, raises a deep and difficult challenge for their approach to critical theory. How can their critical theory be truly critical if it relies on an imperialist meta-narrative to ground its approach to normativity? Now, unlike Habermas and Hanet, the thinkers of the first generation of the Frankfurt School were extremely skeptical about the idea of historical progress, to say the least. In his ninth thesis on the philosophy of history, Walter Benjamin famously depicted progress as the storm that blows in from paradise and irresistibly propels the angel of history into the future. With his back to the future, the angel of history faces the past and, quote, sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet." End quote. Following Benjamin, though only up to a point, Adorno encapsulates this view of progress in his lectures on history and freedom. The only progress we can discern in history goes, as Adorno says, from the slingshot to the megaton bomb. And progress in this sense, he writes, may well provoke satanic mockery. <coughs> Moreover, for Adorno, the catastrophe of Auschwitz, quote, makes all talk of progress towards freedom seem ludicrous, and even makes what he calls the affirmative mentality that engages in such talk look like, quote, the mere assertion of a mind that is incapable of looking horror in the face and that thereby perpetuates it, end quote. Importantly, Adorno doubted not that progress in the future was possible, 
but rather that any sense could be made of the, made of the claim that you, progress in the past is actual. And he was extremely critical of the ways in which belief in the latter becomes a kind of blind faith or ideological mystification that stands in the way of attempts to achieve the former. This is what motivates his paradoxical sounding claim that, quote, progress occurs where it ends. And that um, claim is the sort of inspiration for the title of my book and this talk. Now, Adorno's skepticism about any and all backward-looking claims about historical progress is shared by one of the other great historico-philosophical thinkers of the late 20th century, Michel Foucault. Already in his first major philosophical work, The History of Madness, Foucault announced his intention to write a history that would, quote, remove all chronology and historical succession from the perspective of a progress, to reveal in the history of an experience, a movement in its own right, uncluttered by a teleology of knowledge or the orthogenesis of learning. The aim here is to uncover the design and structures of the experience of madness produced by the classical age. That experience is neither progress nor a step backward in relation to any other." End quote. Foucault's skepticism about claims to progress was motivated less by a moral reaction to the horrors of the 20th century Though clearly there is a moral sensibility at work in his analyses of the ways in which progress in the human sciences is predicated upon the exclusion of madmen, social deviants, homosexuals, and other abnormals. Um, so it's motivated less by moral um, reaction than by the philosophical point, also made by Adorno, that traditional conceptions of historical progress presuppose, necessarily, a supra-historical, atemporal point of view that we now know to be a metaphysical illusion. In this sense, both Foucault and Adorno can be understood as attempting to break out of at least a certain interpretation of Hegelian philosophy of history and its closely related conception of dialectics. And yet Foucault, like Adorno, remained firmly committed throughout his career to the basically Hegelian thought that philosophy, understood as a project of critique, is a historically situated endeavor, that philosophy consists in a critical reflection on our historical present that makes use of the conceptual tools that are themselves the products of history. In this sense, both thinkers can be understood as attempting to think through the possibilities for a thoroughly historicized understanding of critical philosophy, once we no longer have recourse to the notion of the absolute. That is to say, to think through Hegel, but also beyond him. Now, precisely because of their skepticism about progress, Adorno and Foucault are often read as offering a negative philosophy of history, of her false Geschichte, a conservative story of um, history as a process of decline and fall that is, as Habermas puts it, quote, insensitive to the highly ambivalent content of cultural and social modernity. Quote. Habermas maintains that Adorno and Foucault follow Nietzsche in collapsing the distinction between validity and power, and that this leads them to a totalizing critique or abstract negation of the normative content of Enlightenment modernity. Um, in what follows, I counter this interpretation and argue that the critiques of progress found in Adorno and Foucault are in the service of a broader project of imminent critique that aims not at an abstract negation of the normative inheritance of modernity, but rather at a fuller realization of that inheritance. In other words, the critique of progress need not result in a totalizing critique of modernity, but rather can be understood as part and parcel of an imminent critique of modernity that aims to compel those who have inherited the project of the Enlightenment to live up to its own normative ideals of freedom, inclusion, and respect for the other. So the aim of this talk is to recover that theme in the work of Adorno and Foucault and to give some indication of its value for the project of decolonizing political theory. Now the first two sections of the chapter from which this talk is drawn, which I don't have time to present here today, um, reconstruct the alternative histories of Enlightenment modernity presented in Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment and Foucault's History of Madness. Um, I read these two texts alongside each other and in conjunction with Adorno and Foucault's methodological reflections on the philosophy of history, not only because each offers the best account of why their authors are skeptical of the idea that European modernity is the result of a story of historical progress, but also because each text sketches out what I call, following Adorno's use of the term, a determinate negation of Hegelian philosophy of history. That is to say, both texts focus on an issue that was central to Hegel's philosophy of history, 
namely the historically emergent relationship between reason and power. And they do so from within a historicized version of the Kantian project of critique. That is, from within a broadly speaking Hegelian philosophical framework. However, both texts engage in this historicized version of Kantian critique while steadfastly refusing to take up the kind of teleological or progressive reading of history that these authors took to be central to Hegel's version of dialectics. I'm going to try to bracket the question of whether that's the right reading of Hegel or not, because that's a whole other can of worms. Um, so I want to just flag that I'm just thinking about their response to the way that they're understanding Hegel's project. However, this does not mean that these texts should be read, as they often are, as negative <coughs> philosophies of history that trade on a naively romantic vision of some mythic past. Rather, as I will argue in the remainder of this talk, an alternative methodology for the philosophy of history can be found in the work of Adorno and Foucault. This methodology weaves together vindicatory and subversive genealogies, and as such, it reconstructs history as a story of both progress and regress simultaneously. And it does this in the service of a third distinct genealogical aim, a critical problematization of our present historical moment. Moreover, this problematization of our historical present aims not at a totalizing refusal of the normative content of modernity, but rather, I argue, at a fuller realization of that content, in particular the norms of freedom and respect for the other. And finally, in the conclusion, I'll consider how the conception of the relationship between history and normativity that can be found in Adorno and Foucault can help critical theory to engage in the difficult work of decolonizing itself. So um, I apologize for having to skip the kind of detailed readings of the two texts. And what I'm going to get to the good part. Yeah, I get to the good part. So what I'm going to do is um, read the section that um, tries to draw out <coughs> certain themes uh, from those two readings. And um, perhaps if there are questions in the discussion, I can go back and fill in some of the details of the reading that supports it. Um, so, um, this section is organized around, I think, five themes. The first is reason and power. So first, although Adorno and Foucault are both sharply critical of Hegelian narratives of historical progress, particularly of the idea that history is to be understood as the progressive realization of reason, uh, you know, working itself out um, in history, neither of them is committed to a totalizing critique of modernity or an abstract negation of enlightenment <coughs> rationality. For Adorno, quote, what makes, this is from his lecture on history and freedom, what makes the concept of progress dialectical in a strictly non-metaphorical sense is the fact that reason, its organ, is just one thing. That is to say, it does not contain two strata, one that dominates nature and one that conciliates it. Both strata share in all its aspects, end quote. In other words, reason is entangled with power or domination. And we cannot, as critical theorists following Habermas um, have attempted to do, identify a use or a stratum of reason that is not so entangled, that is pure of that entanglement. And yet, Adorno is no advocate of the denial of reason. Indeed, for him, such a denial would be, quote, certainly not a whit superior to the much derided faith in progress, end quote. Rather, the task for philosophy, as Adorno understands it, is to reflect on its own activity as a rational enterprise, and in so doing, to attempt to transcend itself. And this is the aim of what Gordon Finlayson has called Adorno's ethics of resistance. I'll come back to that later on. Similarly, for Foucault, although his work starts from the relationship between reason or rationalization and power, he does not conclude from this that reason should be um, put on trial, as he says. To my mind, he writes, nothing would be more sterile. To say that the entanglement of reason with power justifies putting reason on trial is to find oneself trapped into, as Foucault writes, both playing the arbitrary and boring part of either the rationalist or the irrationalist, a trap that Foucault el elsewhere refers to as the blackmail of the Enlightenment. Now, perhaps unlike Adorno, Foucault is skeptical that, as he puts it, dialectical nuances can help us to escape this trap. Moreover, he suggests that his attempt to analyze specific rationalities, rather than always invoking the pro progress of rationalization in general, distinguishes his approach to the entanglement of rationalities and power relations from that of the Frankfurt School. In other words, he wants to distinguish forms of rationality rather than rationality per se. I'm not sure that's a fair criticism, actually, of dialectic enlightenment, but set that aside. Um, 
Nevertheless, like Adorno, he insists that it is the task of philosophy understood as a mode of critical thought to reflect on its own rational activity and its entanglements with dangerous relations of power. So the central question for critical philosophy is, as he puts it, quote, what is this reason that we use? What are its historical effects? What are its limits and what are its dangers? How can we exist as rational beings, fortunately committed to practicing a rationality that is unfortunately crisscrossed by intrinsic dangers? If it is extremely dangerous to say that reason is the enemy that should be eliminated, it is just as dangerous to say that any critical questioning of this rationality risks sending us into irrationality. So as I see it, both Adorno and Foucault are thinkers of the kind of fundamental entanglement of reason with power, but this doesn't lead them either to reject reason um, at all, but to try to understand this, what Foucault calls the spiral of the relationship between reason and power. Okay, second point about utopia and utopianism. But if the, fact, if the task of philosophy is to reflect on its own rational activity, as Adorno says, and in so doing attempt to tr transcend itself, what sense can be made of this notion of transcendence? If the aim of philosophy is to push beyond itself, then what is meant here by beyond? One might think that there is an implicit and abstract conception of utopia in the background here, and that as, su as such, this view is open to the kind of impotence of the mere ought objection that Hegel leveled against Kant. And incidentally, it was this subjection that attracted Habermas and Hanet to Hegel in the first place. However, Adorno and Foucault are careful to offer only negativistic accounts of utopia or the good life toward which such notions of transcendence might aim. For Adorno, we cannot glimpse the right life from within the wrong one. And for Foucault, we cannot have access to a point of view outside of power relations. So both thinkers are very attuned to the fact that any vision of the good life offered from within a society structured by relations of domination is likely to reproduce those relations of domination, to be infected by them. And as such, they both eschew utopian speculations about what kind of content the good life might have. However, it is worth noting that there is a sense in which both Adorno and Foucault could be seen as more radically utopian thinkers than either Habermas or Hanet. For both thinkers hold on to the possibility and desirability of radical social change in the direction of an open-ended conception of the future. In other words, both Adorno and Foucault envision social transformation not just as the better and fuller realization of our existing normative ideals, for example, a version of liberal democracy that is more transparent and less distorted by power relations, or a recognition order that is more inclusive and egalitarian. Um, so social transformation is not only thought of as that kind of fuller realization of existing normative ideals, but also as the possibility of the radical transformation of those ideals themselves, where that transformation would not necessarily be a regression. The early work of Foucault, in particular, is filled with thought experiments that pose this possibility. Someday we might look back on our present preoccupation with mental illness, for example, um, and wonder what all the fuss was about. And from that point of view, our current historical a priori may well seem as benighted as the classical era's imprisonment of the madman strikes us now. That's kind of a thought experiment that Foucault offers in the appendix to the history of madness. Although we can't imagine what it would be like to inhabit that future point of view, um, there is a critical value for Foucault in being open to it and to the idea that the creatures who would inhabit that point of view would also inhabit a different historical a priori and hence a different moral universe. In order to be genuinely critical, critical theory has to be open to both kinds of social transformation, not just reformism, whether radical or not, that's Habermas's idea, he calls himself a kind of radical reformist, but radical social change. And it has to, to be careful not to prejudge the outcome of such radical transformations, for to do so would necessarily be to presuppose that our own historical form of life is not only superior to all that came before it, but is also unsurpassable. That is, that it constitutes the end point of history. Okay, third point, um, the historicization of history in the capital H. So although Adorno and Foucault are both critical of progressive philosophies of history, as I've already said, um, not, neither of them endorses a conservative or romantic recovery of the mythical past. I mean, this point really leans heavily on the reading of these earlier texts, which are read in a very romantic sort of way often. Um, rather, the aim of their critique of progress narratives is not a rejection, but I suggest a problematization of our historically situated point of view. 
where problematization means at least two things. First, revealing the historical contingency of our own historically situated point of view. And second, showing how that point of view has been contingently made up, and as such, is bound up with particular relations of power. So in the earlier um, section of this chapter, I argued that Foucault's history of madness is best read as an attempt to historicize and problematize the very notion of history with a capital H, where that refers roughly to something like a Hegelian conception of history as the, understood as the progressive realization of reason. Um, and Foucault tries to um, problematize this notion precisely by revealing its historical contingency and analyzing the role that it plays in the exclusion and domination of those who are deemed unreasonable. Similarly, Adorno, in good dialectical fashion, understood his conception of philosophy as historically situated, as itself historically situated. And in this way, he historicized his own conception of historicity. Um, indeed, Adorno is sharply critical of Heidegger's notion of historicity on precisely these grounds, referring to Heidegger's as what he calls an ahistorical concept of history. And he writes, quote, to locate the concept of history in existence amounts paradoxically to an ontological inflation that does away with the concept of history by a sort of conjuring trick. So the differences between thinking of historicity as somehow an ontological condition of human existence or Dasein and thinking of all of one's own philosophical and critical categories, including something like Dasein, as a historically constituted category. So if we are to avoid this ontological inflation through which history becomes um, what Foucault calls mutation as immutability, then we have to locate the concept of history itself in history. <coughs> And only by doing so could we effectively problematize this conception of history, which is, at least as Adorno and Foucault both understand it, part and parcel of problematizing modernity. So the idea is that modernity is marked by its kind of historical mode of thinking through and through. Okay, fourth point, genealogy as problematization, which I've already referred to, but I will spell out a little more here. So in order to effectively problematize our own point of view, Adorno and Foucault both employ an alternative way of thinking about history, which I will characterize it as, as a distinctive kind of genealogical method. So following um, Colin Koopman, um, who in his uh, recent excellent book on Foucault that's entitled Genealogy as Critique, um, builds on some insights from Bernard Williams. Um, Koopman argues, sorry, building on some insights from Bernard Williams, Koopman argues that we can distinguish three different modes of genealogical inquiry subversive, vindicatory, and problematizing. The common core of these three ways of doing genealogy is their attempt to explicate, as Nietzsche famously puts it in the preface to the Genealogy of Morals, quote, a knowledge of a kind that has never yet existed or even been desired, namely a knowledge of the conditions and circumstances in which moral values grew, under which they evolved and changed, end quote. In other words, the common core is a distinctively historical approach that asks the following sorts of questions. How have specific contingent historical processes led human beings to develop and embrace this sort of value or concept? However, each of these three modes of genealogy, genealogical inquiry uses such knowledge for a distinctive end. So the subversive mode of genealogy aims not only to raise the question of the historical emergence of our values, but also to reject them as lacking value in some other more important sense. Vindicatory genealogy, by contrast, traces the historical emergence of our values with an eye toward showing those values to be justified and reasonable. And the third mode of genealogical inquiry, what um, Koopman calls, and I'm following here, the problematizing mode, seeks neither simply to subvert nor to vindicate the values and concepts whose contingent history it uncovers, but rather to problematize them, to call them into question, and to do so by revealing both the dangers and the promise contained therein. So in order to accomplish this aim, the problematizing genealogical method combines subversive and vindicatory strands or elements, but without being either purely subversive or vindicatory. <clears throat> so in a late interview responding to a question about the difficulty of pinning down his political position, Foucault highlights the importance of problematization for his own practice of critique. <coughs> he writes, quote, it is true that my attitude isn't a result of the form of critique that claims to be a methodical examination in order to reject all possible solutions except for the valid one. It is more on the order of a problematization, 
which is to say the development of a domain of acts, practices, and thoughts that seem to me to pose problems for politics. However, the aim of this critical problematization is not, as Foucault's critics have often assumed, to subvert or undermine the acts, practices, and thoughts that are so problematized. Rather, as he put it in an off-quoted passage from another of his late interviews, quote, I would like to do the genealogy of problems, of problematique. My point is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous, which is not exactly the same as bad. If everything is dangerous, then we always have something to do, end quote. Moreover, although the aim of Foucault's genealogies is clearly not to vindicate our current practices or forms of rationality, and I think that much is probably clear to anyone who's ever read any Foucault, there is an important vindicatory element to his problematizing genealogical method, and this, I think, is often not appreciated about what he's doing. This element comes out clearly in the following passage from What is Enlightenment, where he says, quote, I have been seeking to emphasize the extent to which a type of philosophical interrogation one that simultaneously problematizes man's relation to the present, man's historical mode of being, and the constitution of the self as an autonomous subject is rooted in the Enlightenment." So here Foucault situates precisely his problematizing genealogical method within the philosophical ethos of critique that forms the positive normative inheritance, if not of the doctrinal elements, then at least to the permanent, what he calls the permanent reactivation of an attitude of the Enlightenment. Now Adorno, too, clearly rejects any straightforwardly vindicatory approach to history. Um, as he says in Negative Dialectics, quote, after the catastrophes that have happened and in view of the catastrophes to come, it would be cynical to say that a plan for a better world is manifested in history and unites it, end quote. However, his aim is not a straightforward rejection of the values and norms of Enlightenment modernity either. Um, although Adorno was highly critical of the entanglement of the modern principle of equality, for example, with capitalist mechanisms of exchange and bourgeois coldness, and thus with relations of domination, he also regards these principles as important historical achievements that protect individuals from some kinds of injustice. Anyone who, like me, has had experience of what the world looks like when this element of formal equality is removed, Adorno writes, will know from his own experience or at the very least from his own fear, just how much human value resides in this concept of the formal." End quote. So Adorno's position, um, as Jay Bernstein explains, is that, quote, the ideals of the Enlightenment as they have come down to us are a mixture of domination and promise. The equality of individuals in the market is also their reduction to their labor power, and the reduction of labor power to labor time. The concepts which enjoin the freedom of the moral law, respect, fear, and so on, are also repressive." End quote. And the aim of Adorno's philosophy of history is to chart the simultaneous emergence of both the domination and the promise of the ideals of the Enlightenment. And the method for doing so, I'm arguing, is uh, best understood as a kind of problematizing genealogy. Okay, fifth uh, point critical distance or philosophizing with a hammer. However, in order for it to be possible to problematize our own historically situated point of view, uh, what I have elsewhere called our historical, historical a priori, in other words, the historical a priori that is also marked by a certain understanding of history um, that Foucault and Adorno take to be characteristic of modern thought. We must be able to get enough critical distance on that historical a priori that we can see it as a system of thought and reflect on its entanglements with power relations. And Adorno and Foucault offer us two tools for gaining such critical distance. First, both make use of an image or a figure that cannot be reconciled into the dialectical unfolding of history. By resisting recuperation into the dialectic, this figure opens up the possibility of reflection on Hegelian historical modernity. This figure of whatever escapes the reconciling, unifying logic of modernity is, for Adorno, the non-identical, and for Foucault, unreason. <clears throat> Foucault's invocation of unreason should not be read as a metaphysical gesture, as it often is, most famously by Derrida, actually, in his critique of history of madness. Rather, it is the figure of unreason that opens up lines of fragility and fracture within our historical a priori and allows us to take up critical distance on that historical a priori. 
Moreover, the very notion of the historical a priori only has methodological priority in Foucault because he thinks that our modernity is historical. Thus, history enables us to do what he calls an internal ethnology of our own culture, which is necessary for developing a genuinely critical perspective on it. In other words, it's not that he thinks that history is characteristic of reason per se. It's a characteristic of something about our own historical form of life, and so we need to use it to try to get critical distance on that. Similarly, although it might be tempting to see Adorno's negative dialectics as rooted in a metaphysical claim about the non-identical understood as the ultimate uh, thing in itself, that is, as a claim about the impossibility of incorporating the non-identical into our concepts, thus about the impossibility of identity, think identity thinking as such, negative dialectics is better understood as a historically situated response to a particular form of social organization and its accompanying world, world view. In other words, for Adorno, negative dialectics is not a transcendental condition of possibility for thinking, but rather a historically situated tool for thinking through our present moment. And it is necessary because of the historically contingent unfolding of the dialectic of enlightenment. It's a method for jump-starting a historical dialectic that has come to a standstill. However, since our historical a priori sets the historically specific conditions of possibility for thought, for us, that's what a historical a priori, what that concept means, it forms the backdrop for what thought silently thinks, as Foucault once put it. And freeing thought up in relation to what it silently thinks is necessary for enabling it to think differently. But freeing oneself up in this way means pulling oneself free of the very conditions of possibility of one's own thinking and acting. As Martin Zarr puts it, the aim of genealogy as a form of critique is that of, quote, telling the subject the story of the powers working on him, telling it the story of its own becoming. Sar argues that this distinctive goal accounts for the hyperbolic and exaggerated nature of genealogical texts. Only stories told through exaggeration and hyperbole, Sar argues, quote, release the explosive power contained in the revelation of processes of power and forceful construction. In this sense, genealogies are textual shocks and momentous negative world disclosures, end quote. So while the shape and contours of some prior historical epoch, not our own, could be uncovered through a gentle digging. In order to see one's own historical a priori as historical, one must philosophize with a hammer, as Foucault put it, or pitilessly mirror the descent of enlightenment into barbarism, as Foucault and Adorno put it. For, as they write in Dialect of Enlightenment, only thought which does violence to itself is hard enough to shatter myths. Okay, so uh, last point um, is on problematization and the normative inheritance of modernity. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the problematization of our own point of view should be understood not as a rejection of or an abstract negation of the normative inheritance of modernity, but rather as a fuller realization of its central value, namely freedom. As Fabian Freienhagen has argued, despite Adorno's relentless and radical critique of modern capitalism and enlightenment rationality, he also believed that freedom is, quote, fundamentally historical, um, in that it, quote, came into its own only once the modern self, the self-reflecting individual, had developed, end quote. Moreover, Adorno's account of second nature reveals the close link between his philosophy of history and the possibility of freedom. Central to Adorno's account of the relationship between nature and history is the idea that historically constituted objects come over time to seem natural and therefore unchangeable. Revealing this second nature to be historically contingent and therefore changeable is a crucial task of critical theory for Adorno. As Adorno puts it, quote, interpretation is criticism of phenomena that have been brought to a standstill. It consists in revealing the dynamism stored up in them so that what appears as second nature can be seen to have a history. Criticism ensures that what has evolved loses its appearance as mere existence and stands revealed as the product of history. And this entails uncovering the illusory, congealed history contained within second nature, an illusion that is reinforced by narratives of historical progress. And this is very close, I think, to Foucault's characterization of genealogy 
<clears throat> as the attempt to record the singularity of events outside of any finality. In doing so, Foucault writes, it must seek them in the most unpromising places, in what we tend to feel is without history. This sort of unmasking of the congealed history contained within what we tend to feel is without history breaks history's illusory and ideological spell. And this is how Adorno understands freedom. The positive meaning of freedom, he writes, lies in the potential, in the possibility of breaking the spell or escaping from it. <clears throat> breaking or escaping from the spell, fleeing thought, freeing thought up from what it silently thinks in order to enable it to think differently, these are both ways of realizing freedom. So for both Adorno and Foucault, I argue, the problematization of our point of view has a normative point. It aims not at a debunking of the core normative ideals of enlightenment modernity, but rather at a fuller realization of the <coughs> ideal of freedom. But Adorno's work goes even further than this by also suggesting that the problematization of our own point of view not only enhances our freedom in relation to second nature or to our historical a priori, it also is required if we are to do justice to the other. This idea comes out clearly in the final lecture of Adorno's lectures on moral philosophy. After spending most of that lecture course offering a detailed and devastating critique of Kantian moral philosophy, Adorno argues in his final lecture that moral philosophy can only be possible today as a critique of moral philosophy. Life under modern capitalism is so deformed and distorted that moral philosophy today cannot provide plans or blueprints for living the good life. As Adorno famously laments in Minimum Morale, <coughs> wrong life cannot be lived rightly. Hence, the goal of moral philosophy should be to uncover this situation and to reflect on, rather than to obscure, deny, or ignore, the contradictions to which it leads. The most that one can say about the good life under current conditions is, as Adorno says, that it would consist in resistance to the forms of the bad life that have been seen through and critically dissected by the most progressive minds. All, other than this, the negative prescription, no guidance can really be envisaged. So following on from his critique of Kant, Adorno contends that we have to resist the abstract rigorism of Kantian morality, but without giving up on the notions of conscience and responsibility, without which the idea of the good life is inconceivable. At this point, Adorno writes, we find ourselves really and truly in a contradictory situation. We need to hold fast to moral norms, to self-criticism, to the question of right and wrong, and at the same time to a sense of the fallibility of the authority that has the confidence to undertake such self-criticism. We have to hold fast persistently to the norms that we learned from our experience, while at the same time engaging in self-criticism of what presents itself as unyielding or inexorable. And this requires an awareness of our own fallibility but where this fallibilism is understood as both an epistemic stance and a moral one. As Adorno puts it, quote, the element of self-reflection has today become the true heir to what used to be called moral categories. To say that self-reflection is a moral category is to say that it is only by reflecting on our own limitations that we can learn to do justice to those who are different. And, as Adorno writes, that true injustice is always to be found at the precise point where you put yourself in the right and other people in the wrong. This is why Adorno claims that if you were to press him into offering a list of cardinal virtues, he says, quote, he would probably respond cryptically by saying that I could think of nothing except for modesty, by which he means that we must have a conscience but may not insist on our own conscience. So I submit that the best way of achieving the stance of modesty that Adorno is talking about here is the work of critique understood as the problematization of our own point of view. And that the best method for such problematization is a historical one that combines both vindicatory and subversive or progressive and regressive elements. By allowing us to reflexively critique the social institutions and practices, patterns of cultural meaning and subject formation, and normative commitments that have made us who we are, Problematizing critique opens up a space of critical distance on those institutions, practices, and so forth, thereby freeing us up in relation to them, and thus also in relation to ourselves. Now notice that um, for Adorno, and here Adorno goes beyond Foucault, I think in an important way, 
What motivates this stance of modesty is not only the epistemic point that we have a tendency to go wrong in our normative judgments, and thus we have a duty to call them into question. In other words, it's not just a kind of pessimistic induction on looking back at all the times we've you know, made mistakes. Although Adorno was enough of a historicist and a practitioner of imminent critique to agree with Foucault um, when Foucault writes, quote, that we have to give up on hope of ever acceding to a point of view that could give us access to any complete and definitive knowledge of what may constitute our historical limits, and thus that as far as the project of critique goes, we are always in the position of beginning again, end quote. Here Adorno is making the further claim that the problematization of one's own point of view is morally required if we are to do justice to those who are different from ourselves. In other words, and here is a different way of construing the normative point of the method of problematization. Such problematization is motivated not merely by epistemic concerns about our inescapable fallibility, given our inability to have access to a God's eye point of view, but also by our commitment to equal respect for the other, that is, to justice. So what emerges from this consideration of the conceptions of critique in the work of Adorno and Foucault is the idea that critique should aim at the problematization of our own taken-for-granted point of view, of what has become second nature for us, and that the most effective method for this is a historico-philosophical genealogical method that draws on both vindicatory and subversive readings of history, but where the normative point of this method is the fuller realization of the ideals and freedom, of freedom and justice that are part of the normative inheritance of the Enlightenment. As such, Adorno and Foucault offer a radically different way of thinking about historical progress in both its backward and forward-looking aspects. Both reject any vindicatory, backward-looking story of historical progress as a fact about what has led up to us. Um, so they both reject this kind of backward-looking story of history as a process of social evolution or moral learning that has led up to the European Enlightenment point of view. But they do so not in favor of a romantic story of decline and fall, but rather in the service of a critical problematization of the present. Moreover, at least for Adorno, if not for Foucault, the forward-looking conception of progress is a moral political imperative, in other words, the idea that we might make progress in the future towards some uh, better state, is not abandoned, but it is radically decoupled from the backward-looking conception of progress as a historical fact. And here I should just fill in that one of the um, main arguments of some of the earlier chapters of the book is that <coughs> For Habermas and Honneth, um, they are both committed both to a kind of backward-looking story about historical progress as a process of moral learning <coughs> or social evolution um, that leads up to um, something like the European Enlightenment point of view. And that's actually their strategy, I argue, for avoiding the twin kind of evils of foundationalism and relativism, is to kind of ground the normative perspective in a story of historical unfolding. Um, so they're committed to that kind of backward-looking idea, but also to a forward-looking idea of progress as um, you know, a moral political imperative of attempting to realize a just society. And the two um, ideas are importantly intertwined in their work. So it's the backward-looking story of social evolution or moral learning that actually provides the normative justification for the forward-looking story. Um, so in other words, the vision of the good life is um, pulled out of a story of social evolution or moral learning. And in that sense, the forward-looking story relies on the backward-looking story. Okay, so for Adorno, if not for Foucault, the forward-looking conception of progress as a moral political imperative is not abandoned, but it is radically decoupled from the backward-looking conception of progress as a historical uh, fact, quote-unquote. In stark contrast to Habermas and Honneth, for both of whom the backward-looking story of historical learning, social evolution, or progress plays a crucial role in grounding their normative visions of what would count as progress in a forward-looking sense, Adorno claims that calling into question the conception of progress as a historical fact is necessary for any kind of future progress to be possible. Thus, Adorno does not give up on the possibility of progress in the future. In fact, he finds such a resignation to be not only conceptually problematic, but also morally repugnant. His understanding of what might, count, what might count as progress in the future is not rooted in a backward-looking story of progress as what has led up to us. 
And this is why, for Adorno, progress occurs only where it comes to an end. Now, although this claim of Adorno's was not motivated by post-colonial concerns, and although his relationship to post-colonial scholarship, like Foucault's, is rather vexed and complicated, it seems to me that this idea is enormously productive for the project of decolonizing critical theory. And I just have a brief conclusion where I'll sketch out some of that um, idea. So as I just mentioned, both Adorno and Foucault have a complex and somewhat vexed relationship to post-colonial theorizing. Um, Foucault has both inspired a great deal of post-colonial scholarship, including, but certainly not limited to, Said's Orientalism and Gayatri Spivak's critique of post-colonial reason. Um, but it's also, he's also been harshly criticized by post-colonial thinkers for his lack of attention to colonial and imperial power dynamics, and even his occasional lapses into Orientalism, his whole discussion of the Ars Erotica um, in History of Sexuality, Volume 1. Such issues have played out somewhat differently in the case of Adorno. Um, it's frequently remarked that Adorno um, was deeply and bluntly Eurocentric. Um, you know, and both his critics and his defenders have noted that point. And yet, in recent years, there has been a wave of interesting attempts to claim Adorno as a thinker with substantial resources to offer post-colonial theory. In light of these complex debates, which I will not even attempt, attempt to settle here, I want to emphasize in closing that my point here is not that post-colonial theory needs Foucault or Adorno. Um, such a claim would smack of a problematic assumption that post-colonial theory consists in nothing more than an elaboration of philosophical positions that were developed first in European philosophy. Or even that these thinkers are important resources for post-colonial theorizing, though I think this may well be the case, but that's not really my point. Rather, my point is that Adorno and Foucault, for all of their faults and their own Eurocentrism and blindness to issues of colonialism and imperialism, are nevertheless important resources within the tradition of critical theory for the crucially important project of decolonizing critical theory within by allowing it to open itself up to questions of post-colonial <coughs> difference. And this is the case precisely because and to the extent to which they enable us to rethink critical theory's commitment to the idea of historical progress, an idea that has been thoroughly implicated in the logic of colonialism and thus subjected to withering critique by post-colonial thinkers. Moreover, their commitment to what Adorno calls modesty leads them to radically reverse the Habermasian approach to post-colonial difference. So whereas for Habermas, we take the position um, in the encounter, in the kind of intercultural dialogue encounter, um, that we know or at least believe our form of life to be developmentally superior to traditional forms of life, but that we are open to being proved otherwise. Um, of course, in a dialogue to be conducted on our terms. By contrast, for Foucault and Adorno, we take the position that we are committed to certain substantive normative principles in as much as our form of life and sense of ourselves as practical moral agents depends on or derives from them, but that those very ideals demand, themselves demand of us an awareness of the violence inherent in them and also a fundamental modesty or humility regarding their metanormative status or authority. But this is just to say that Adorno and Foucault allow critical theorists to enter the encounter with the post-colonial other without presuming that we already know what the outcome of that encounter should be, with an openness to the very real possibility of unlearning. Indeed, both see a kind of unlearning, a problematization of our own point of view that frees us up in relation to it as the very point of our engagement with history, and thus as the point of critique itself. As such, their, room, their work makes room for the kind of openness to the other that Depeche Chakrabarty has characterized as, quote, a capacity to hear that which one does not already understand. Both Foucault and Adorno allow us to see how we might open ourselves up to post-colonial difference while realizing that and accepting that we may be radically transformed in this encounter and that our future selves may well regard that transformation as a kind of progress and we who resisted it as benighted. Moreover, both Foucault and Adorno understand this openness to be rooted not in a flat-footed rejection of the ideals of European modernity or enlightenment, 
but rather in a reflexive realization of their core notions of freedom and justice. As such, both thinkers make possible a radical transformation within critical theory itself, a decolonization of critical theory that can enable it to be truly critical of its own ongoing investments in a certain kind of post-Kantian imperialism. 